welcome Let's Super play. Diablo. Yo, wrestling fans, welcome to Indie Handshake, Edición de Lucha Libre. I am your host, Jesus Cruz, and today my guest is a veteran of the pro wrestling scene, one of the first mass wrestlers in the 90s to, to, uh, when that 90s indie boom happened in the Bay Area. Super Diablo, how you doing, brother? I'm doing good, man. Uh, how you doing? <laughs> Good, man. Just as good as we can be with this, you know, pandemic. But uh, here we are. How's, how's the family? Fam family's awesome. Um, you know, we're just worked up with all this California heat. You know, it's, it's just crazy over here. Stuff that's going on up in our state. Yeah, that's true, man. So the first time I met Super Diablo was through Big Time Wrestling. I was doing video production for Big Time Wrestling at their TV studio. And, you know, I, I, I saw Super Diablo in action, but never really had an interaction with him until... Uh, New York Days. New York Days was a festival in the city of New York, California, where they had wrestling, you know, the carnival. They had fun for the family. While I was recording uh, New York Days, I was recording their matches for Big Time Wrestling. And then afterwards, I was with my friends and some cops rolled on us. You know, they thought we were gang members. I don't know how. I had a Santo, Hijo de Santo teacher. <laughs> but they were, they were just hassling us. You know, they pulled me aside. They were checking me for drugs and all this crap. And then Super Diablo happened to walk by you know, had my back, you know, I was probably 17 years old at the time. And he, uh, yeah, he talked the officer down and they let me go. Yeah. You know, I remember it. I remember it real, real clear to the date. And, um, I, I would have did not, you know, I, I would definitely wouldn't have walked by, you know, you're one of the boys and, um, you know, I had your back no matter what, uh, hey, if it would if it would have came to blows, it would have came to blows. Uh, it wouldn't have been my first time, you know, slugging out a police officer. I'm sorry, to, sorry to say that, but uh, yeah. it wouldn't have been my first time. But um, yeah, you you were you weren't doing anything wrong, and and you were a good kid, man. And hey, uh, I had your back that whole time. Yeah, I appreciate that, man. To this day, I really appreciate that. So yeah, then we became friends and. You know, uh, we started, you know, doing videos and, you know, he worked some of my shows, but we'll get to that in a second. So let's get to how you discovered pro wrestling, because we had a conversation yesterday that's very interesting uh, of when you were a kid uh, uh, back in the, was it Oakland Coliseum? Yeah, uh, it started, it started actually before that. Uh, the thing is, is when I was born, like I told you, um, a lot of people don't know I'm completely blind in one eye. And it has a lot to do with the screens and everything else. Uh, but I was born with glaucoma in both eyes and I couldn't see. And it just messed my mom and my dad up pretty bad. And, and you know, to have a kid like that, you're a Puerto Rican heritage. And it was kind of like a, like a darkness over, over your whole family at that time when I was born. And um, so they pretty much like split up and, and walked away when they had their own families, left me behind. Um, I hate to put it that way, but my grandparents from both sides, Puerto Rico and from here, they're also from Puerto Rico, but they were living in California at the time, came to an agreement to raise me here uh, because I've had probably over 30 eye surgeries uh, and it was difficult. And uh, my grandparents here just stuck it through and um, raised me the best they could. And um, I was raised with, you know, around horses and, and chickens and all the other stuff, hard work. Uh, but on the other hand, a lot of my family was all real gang related. So people really didn't expect anything to come out of me at all. Like they thought I'd be dead, like by the time I'm like uh, 15 years old. Uh, but at the time, my grandfather was a hardcore wrestling fanatic. So he would take us to the Cow Palace and watch big time wrestling. And then we even drove up to LA sometimes to go watch um, some of the Lucha Libre. And I remember seeing Andre the Giant up there for a little while. Um, but uh, he would tell me that my father was a wrestler, <laughs> it's gonna make you laugh, a wrestler called Yolanka. So that's gonna be deep with a lot of Lucha Libre fans that are watching this now, they're all gonna be Googling Yolanka. Uh, but he told me that that was my father and he was a mask wrestler. <laughs> um, and I grew up believing that. And so I was focused every week, you know, watching wrestling. And I wanted to see Yolanka, like, get in there and, and do his thing. Uh, 
but he disappeared and my parents were, you know, they were coming around, started coming around my life. And I found out real fast that he wasn't my father. Uh, but um, I was amateur wrestling. Uh, they got me into amateur wrestling, got me off the streets. And then um, when I turned 15 years old, well, actually let's go back. When I was younger from that, um, me and my uncle, we didn't really have money. So my uncle, I don't know how he got the connection, but he got it to where we were carrying wrestlers bags. So we would catch Bart over here uh, in the Bay Area and we would go to the uh, Oakland Coliseum and they would give us tickets uh, to carry the wrestlers bags in and to carry them out. And what, uh, what, what promotion was this? That was for the AWA. So it was the AWA with through uh, Vern Gagne and um, they would they would do some things to help out the local kids that really didn't have and um, yeah it I carried everybody's bag from Andre the Giant's bag to Hulk Hogan's bag. Uh, I think I sent you a photo of the very first program that Hulk Hogan was on the cover uh, of a program and he signed it for me and throughout the whole program it's signed by Andre the Giant and everybody else. And I was just a little guy and they would give me tickets in the second row and my seat was always like right next to John Madden, you know, the, the former coach of the Raiders. And the funny thing is I'm a Cowboy fan. I always have been a Cowboy fan, but him and his wife, they liked me a lot and they always bought me like a hot dog and a soda at the Coliseum. And um, yeah, they really looked out. They gave back to the community at the time. And, and that was really, really giving back. Not saying, not doing a promo where kids are sitting there with the superstar. No, they really, really gave it back. Uh, in those days and I loved it and that was my early way of getting into it and then later on it would lead up to um, me getting into the ring with um, Junkyard Dog uh, when WWE, WWF started coming to town after and um, that was probably one of the last days that I carried a bag or whatever and um, WWF came and uh, Junkyard Dog and Sergeant Slaughter were in the ring at the, at the very end of the night and they won and JYD brought a bunch of kids from the crowd and I was one of them. They grabbed me out of there and I was a break dancer at the time and they had me break dance and, and do the pop in and the strutting and everything else in the ring. And you're looking around at a sold out arena in Oakland uh, and it was, it was incredible. It was my, my way of getting into pro wrestling at a young age. <laughs> had that wow. taste. That is, yeah, that is quite a, quite a way to start, and, and, you know. So after, you know, you said you did some uh, high school wrestling? Yeah, I did. Uh, I amateur wrestled from about the fourth grade up. And then I ended up uh, meeting Alexis Smirnoff and Jerry Monty. Jerry Monty. Uh, he was a local guy and he, he was kind of like a higher end jobber, you know, but he was booked a lot. Like this guy was booked all the time. Uh, and Alexis Smirnoff was one of the bigger names for big time wrestling. He was the guy that was main eventing in, in chain matches and tape fist matches and all that against Pat Patterson at the uh, Cow Palace. And they were selling that place out. Um, it was just really weird, you know, and they didn't have no music. They didn't have no fireworks, no explosions or whatever. It's just that their character and their heat was so larger than life. Uh, when they walked out, because the moment they came through the curtain, you knew who that character was, and you knew whether to boo him or whether to cheer him. And um, Alexis Smirnoff was just that Russian villain that just everybody hated. And the very first time I met him, I was scared to death, I'll be honest, even though I was like an amateur wrestler. And um, But it, it was so weird um, seeing that, and they were over, and I knew that I wanted to do that, and as a matter of fact, one night in the Cow Palace, they sent me in the ring to help clean out the ring because the ring was covered in blood. And it was from Bobby the Brain Heenan. Um, and so I jumped in the ring and it's funny because I grabbed the program that they gave me that night and I got his picture on it and I slammed it in his own blood and then he signed it for me. And I still have that program today. So it pretty much has his DNA still on it and it's signed. It's, I, I don't advise anybody to do that nowadays, yeah. uh, but in the 70s and the early 80s, that's that's pretty much how it was. Hey, man, uh, 
if they ever need if they ever need a clone, you have his DNA, man. I have it, yeah, in a program. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, it was it was just one of those things. And then my uncles, the internet, they they saw an ad with Smirnoff and Jerry to uh, that there was a wrestling school opening up in Fairway Park in Hayward, California, over here. And my uncle went down with my cousin and my other uncle and they tried out for the school and you know obviously everything's about money so if you got money they'll train you but one of my other uncles they he was just too old and they refused to train him uh and they ended up training my uncle and he wrestled as danny garcia and then so my this other is jerry money right yeah jerry money and, and smirnoff they had the school together and um they trained my cousin uh, and his name was Julio, and um, he wrestled as like Ricky Romero for a little while. Um, but I would go to all their trainings because I was so young, and you know, I was 14, 15 years old, probably even 14. Um, so I would go with all of them, even the days that they wouldn't go, uh, because those trainings were just so physical, you know, and they were finding out that wrestling wasn't as fake as everybody thinks it is. You know, the trainings were just brutal. And I would still go and watch. And so uh, one night, uh, one day, Smirnoff uh, said, hey, kid, get in the ring and, uh, you know, let's roll you around and all that because you're here all the time, you know, and, and we could see that you really love wrestling and all that. So they threw me into the ropes, and it was weird because from watching them, I already knew how to hit the ropes. I knew how to take bumps uh, because I would watch, and I'd go home, and I'd work on it my, on my own. And so they threw me into the ropes. And they gave me a big backdrop, and I landed on my feet. And right then and there, Smirnoff was at my grandmother's house, like the like the next day or the day after, and said, "How can we get this kid signed? Um, what can we do?" Because the state athletic commission had a, a thing. It was real state athletic commission in those days. But we're talking 1987. So the school opened in '86, and then I got trained in '87. And the only other young wrestler at that time that was on the shows that I was on um, was a guy named Louis Spicoli. So we were the same age, so we had the same problem and it was the State Athletic Commission. They just refused to let us, you know, work, continue to work in the United States. So we How had a- you again, sorry? Uh, 15, 15 years old. Yeah, so we, um, we did that and I liked Louis Spicoli. He was, he was a cool dude, and, and we were young, you know. We wanted to go out there and set the best show we could versus a lot of the old-timers that were going out there and doing a lot more heat, a lot more of a storyline. And, you know, it seems boring to some nowadays, but at my age now, uh, it makes total sense because you have to have that storyline in a match or there is no match. You could do... 150 backflips or 500 high spots or whatever and people won't remember you but they'll remember that storyline and that big comeback uh and that heat where the guy got the guy in the corner you know the the good guy got him in the corner finally and he goes he's getting ready to hit him and the ref steps in and then the bad guy reaches in his boot and pulls out like a foreign object and hits him and now the crowd's really just pissed off that goes over, to be honest, way more than a shitload of high spots that people don't remember anymore because everybody's doing it. Uh, but in those days, they weren't doing it. And it, it was weird because there was very little locker room matches, I call them, uh, in those days. So when you were, when you went through those camps, um, those like the Smirnoff camp, they would just toss you in the ring. And they, it wasn't like we're going to do uh, tackle, drop down, hip toss, uh, arm drag, you know, it, it was none of that. Uh, you just got in the ring and everything was just how professional you were and you figure out how to hide when you're, when you're talking to your opponent or whatever in the ring, whatever you need to do. You figure out how to hide that really fast where the, that person in the front row doesn't even know that you're even communicating with the, um, your opponent, let alone the referee as well. And we would even communicate with the timekeeper through there at those days. Uh, but that it's just the difference of the way it is now and the way it is back then. And back then was a big, huge kayfabe compared to now. So now we could kind of get away with talking about it. 
Um, but back then, it was like you started off and Smirnoff would come to the back and he's like, hey, this is the way it is. Your match starts, it has, you have to have a good lockup. Your lockup has to be really solid and professional to show that you mean business. And then you might be able to get one spot in right there and then start working towards that middle of the match towards a big comeback. And then either the screw job finish or the finish is gonna happen. And I'll tell you one thing, if when you walk through the curtains in those days, in the old days, I'm talking with the old timers because I have been in the ring uh, at that school with Smirnoff, with Jerry Monte, with, Ken, with Kenji Shibuya, with Ray Stevens, um, Pepper Gomez. Pepper Gomez managed me, me and my uncle for a little while, um, and Woody Farmer. Um, those were real big dogs. Like these weren't like small guys. Like even if Ray Stevens was, you know, five eight, or Pepper Gomez was five six, because uh, I think that I was even taller than Pepper. Those guys were built, and they were the real deal. I mean, if you if you had something to argue about, they'll slug you out right there and you ain't gonna walk out the ring, you know, being, you know, not having a lump all over you, you know, or possibly knocked out and left there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's just the way it is. And you got in the ring and when you got there, you would just walk into the uh, arena or the place that you're at, the convention center or wrestle at a shitload of armories. Um, you would just walk in and they would say like your name on there. And I wrestled at the time under Super, under uh, Little Rascal. That's what they called me because I was so young and I was cocky. So Smirnoff sent me out as a bad guy. Um, and he had me wrestling all the local old timers. And I'll tell you, I never ever won a match. It was weird you go from amateur wrestling where you're like whooping ass, right? And then you go into pro wrestling, you got to pay your dues. And I never ever won a match for actually a few years. You know, um, it was just night after night, just jobbing out. Uh, to all these old timers uh, that were on their last leg, but did you have a, you know, sorry, did you have a mask on your leg, Rascal? No, no, nah, I I went without a mask. So you know, I was going through teen puberty too. So you know, I had pimples and and everything else. And to see a little, see some cocky kid out there uh, that's just arguing it up with the fans um, made it even worse. I was spit on, um, just uh, pushed, shoved. Uh, got punched going to the ring from fans because uh, you could get up close to that. But what I was saying is what Smirnoff's strategy was is he could sit back in the dressing room and not even watch that match or any promoter in those days and Roland Alexander would later take on that old Roy Shires um, mentality because Roy Shires from the original big time wrestling, the original owner would do that. And he'd sit in the back and instead of watching your match, he would listen to it. So the moment that you would walk out, and we didn't have music, we didn't have anything, they would tell whether you're over or not and whether they were going to bring you back. And then if you left the fans just booing or really cheering at the end of that match, and during that match, somewhat in that comeback where people are screaming and they're going home and they can't even talk because they've done scream from that comeback so much, they knew that you were something and they were going to bring you back. And those that couldn't get that pop, they, they sent packing. They sent them walking. Okay. So um, how long were you there with Smirnoff and, um, and, and uh, Jerry Monty? And where did you go afterwards? Did they close down or did you Yeah, they, they closed down probably about they – they only had that school open for maybe three years, I'd say. Uh, I don't know if they had to reconcile differences or what happened between the two of them. I know Smirnoff looked after me like a son because he knew I, I never really had anybody in my life. And even one day we were on the road and I had no money and I had no money to start off like my senior year of high school uh, for, for school clothes. And he went through and he's like, hey kid, here's my credit card. You know, go with your cousin uh, Julio and go shop and pick some stuff up. You know, um, you're, you're one of us. And he really took care of me on the road uh, and I'm very grateful for that, man. I, I cried my eyeballs out uh, when he passed away. And it, it was just um, one of those things, you know, I wish I could have been up there, you know. Um, he was Canadian in real life and uh, just 
one of the most vicious villains on screen, but one of the warmest, hardest people you would meet. And um, Woody Farmer was a lot like that as well. Okay. So where did you, so, where did you go after? So after that, uh, Jerry Machu came up to me and he told me, hey, he goes, we're not going to be booking a lot of smaller guys anymore. Um, he goes, we want to bring in bigger guys. He goes, but there's a guy named Woody Farmer who is running a thing called Bay Area Wrestling. And um, I think I, uh, my uncle is already there. My uncle done left because uh, he got, him and Smirnoff just weren't getting along. Like it, it was just one of those things. And Woody gave him a better place to, where he could headline and, and, you know, he was wrestling with Shane Cody all the time. Uh, and him and Shane became good friends. And um, so he invited me down and I went down and I met Woody. Um, and Woody was, I, when I shook his hand, I'm like, wow, this guy is just as big as Smirnoff, if not even bigger. Um, I'm like, wow, this, you know, he's, he's like a real strong guy and, and up front, but really soft spoken. And he gave me a shot and he's like, hey, Mo, he goes, what I want to do is I want to bring um, light heavyweights to TV uh, because it's never been done before. Um, and this is when WWE was starting to bring in the rockers at the time and all that. And so I'm like, sounds good. And here I am, they gave me my tryout and I'm doing topes through the, through the ropes and shit and, you know, flying out the ring on guys and, and everything else. And a guy named Johnny, we call him Johnny Pearson, and his name is Mikey, you know, uh, Mikey Lockwood. Uh, later on, we'll go on to be Crash Holly. It was weird because when I was amateur wrestling, we were in the same tournaments. But he wrestled for Clovis, and then I wrestled here in the Bay Area. So we would, in the big tournaments like North Coast and all those other ones, we would meet each other. And we were the same weight class and everything else. Um, but he was there, and along there was Jason Rogers, well, Jason Styles now. And so there was another guy there named Tom Franklin, who was from Texas. Uh, so there was plenty of smaller guys for me to work with, but my style was a whole lot different than theirs because Woody was the one that was training them versus my style that was a little bit more reckless, a little bit more martial artist, and I you know, I wasn't afraid to die in the ring. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. And there was no fear whatsoever. Uh, I was either balls in or not do it at all. Uh, and they found that out real quick. And um, man, it, it was weird because we brought it to TV. Let's just zoom up a little forward. Uh, we brought it to TV. And when we got there, Woody's like, my uncle comes up to me, he goes, we're going to need you to wear this. And I go, what do you mean? I go, you're El Diablo, you know? He goes, no, I wrestled here with Danny Garcia, and he came out with a sombrero and all that. He goes, but here's my old outfit. We want you to put it on. So you're going to wrestle as El Diablo because they're going to job you out, pretty much. So... I'm like, all right, I just, wanted, I just wanted to wrestle. I didn't care if it was TV or, or what. I just wanted to get out. And so I did, and my first match there, I believe, was with Tom Franklin. And here I am doing dives out the ring and everything, and it just blew up. And then it was weird because I ended up wrestling um, Johnny Pearson on Bear Wrestling TV. And... Some of the stuff that we did in that match, it was nobody's done on WWF or anything at that time. So here we are, we do, we do in the same match, we do the, uh, I, pick, I pick him up for a pile driver and then I lean back and then he reversed it into a pile driver and then gave me one. And it was so weird because we were on Pacific Sports Network, Sports Channel at that time. The following week, um, I don't remember if it was Shawn Michaels or Marty Jannetty, did that same exact move on live TV for the WWF. So I feel like we were being watched, man. And next thing you know, they started having guys come in and they started flying. Um, and it was just one of those things. And I feel that 
Woody Farmer has a lot to do with um, his decision to bring light heavyweights to the forefront like how he did in those days. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. And I remember I do have footage of you wrestling in Bay Area wrestling, and your mask was more like, uh, do you know who Solar, the Lucha yeah. Solar? With with the uh like the soul flare the oh, soul yeah. Flare. yeah. So how, how did you end up how did you end up coming up with the super diablo character and, and the, the the design of the mask you have now? Well that mask wasn't even the original mask. The original mask that they sent me out with the very first time I got there was uh, just a solid red one and it had white trim on it and that was it. Um and then after that it turned to an orange one. I go, if I'm gonna wear a mask, I'm not gonna wear a red mask. I'm gonna wear it after Halloween because Halloween's my favorite day of the year. It, you know, I just love it. So I wanted to mask orange and black. So I called K and H and they couldn't make the mask in orange and black because they weren't used to making masks and all they would do is make the old styles that you know, like the old timers would wear, you know, like if they're a villain or something, you know, like an executioner or something like that, right? So they sent me this, instead of orange and black, they sent me this hot orange mask with white trim on it the same way that that red one was so i wore that one for a while and so then i sent them um an actual sketch and said i want this you know so i want flames on the front those were intended to be flames and they made the mask in orange and black like i wanted but i don't know what that was you know <laughs> whatever they put on there and we had to shoot tv and i was like man i have no choice i have to wear it yeah. And then right after we did that in that outfit, I don't remember who I wrestled. I wrestled some guy from Japan. And um, Woody pulled me aside. And it started a big debate with him and this lady that was there named Kathy Kearney. And she called a lot of shots. Um, so I don't know how far she knew the business, but I know that her and Woody were really close and she called a lot of shots. And Woody went behind her back and he pulled me in the office and he's like, hey, we need to make you a good guy because people are cheering you. Um, do, I don't know if we need to change your name. He goes, I'm sorry, I, don't, I know you just got your trunks um, and everything else in the mask. What could we do? And um, I said, well, the El Diablo thing has to go. Uh, so in Mexico, these flyers like Super Astro and all those guys, they're putting that super in the front and it's that just the name super is turning them into the good guy the hero and um so woody agreed and he's like yeah he goes so now what i want you to do is we're going to call you super diablo and he goes i want you just doing all that shit head scissors drop kicks arm drags i want you to arm drag people in different ways so what i did instead of arm dragging them the old way i watched old ricky steamboat uh tapes and um, I started arm dragging him like Ricky Steamboat uh, did with the Macho Man, especially in WrestleMania 3. And um, it stuck. Next thing you know, I'm seeing a lot of all the shows that I'm on. Um, I'm with a lot. I'm on, I'm on a lot of shows with the guys from L.A. with uh, Luis Piccoli and, all, and his crew that he had, you know, um, and shoot, we're mixing it up. And I started putting martial arts in it because I was a huge like Mortal Kombat fan and a huge uh, fan of uh, uh, Bruce Lee. Mm -hmm. So um, I started throwing some of that in and then Super Diablo was born. Okay. So from Super Diablo, how was it being a Puerto Rican uh, uh, ancestry, being a Puerto Rican descent, how was it taking in what was considered more of a Mexican tradition uh, of Lucha Libre? How did that, how did that feel? Um, did the luchadors see you a little different because you weren't Mexican or did you ever have any issue with that? Yeah, I, I did have one big issue with that. Uh, but as far as being the, the Mexican and Puerto Rican thing, to me, that only flew in boxing, right? Because the Mexican and Puerto Ricans are always at each other in boxing. Mm -hmm. uh, but reality wise, when you're out on the streets and you grew up with all your friends, I'm in a neighborhood where everybody's Mexican. Um, so all my friends are Mexican. Um, everybody else I was around was Mexicans. I was around more Mexicans than I was Puerto Ricans. Um, but they started bringing me out from Mexico. And to be honest, I, I didn't have a problem with it because I thought it was normal, you know, it's who I was. You know, my whole neighborhood was 
was uh, Mexicanos and, and all my friends were Mexicanos and, and the music that we listened to at our house, it, it was a mixture, you know, we listened to um, salsa and merengue, but on the other hand, most of it was ranchera music, you know, so, and it, to me, it was more about being Latino and, and, and you know, culture and raza and, and just, you know, just celebrating that uh, factor of it. Uh, so I know we fast forward a little bit, since, but since we're talking about, so we were talking about the when Worlds Collide pay-per-view, they had WCW, AAA, and uh, I forgot the third promotion. IWC. IWC. They, they did this huge pay-per-view in LA. And, you know, you had Eddie Guerrero, Hijo de Santo, Octagon, you had Conan, Pedro Aguayo, Luis Piccoli. So how did you come across there? Because you were supposed to wrestle there. So tell us that story. How did that how did you come across that contact? Yeah, I'll go. I'll go real quick into that one because um, I know that we're on top, we're on borrowed time. Um, but the, it, it actually came up through a guy named Mike Leno that was the a writer. And um, when we spoke the other when we spoke the other day, I was telling you about that he did like a negative review on an APW show that we were all doing. And I don't remember if I got a negative review or which matches were, but the crew there in APW had a really big problem with them. And um, he's never done nothing wrong to me. I, I've always liked everybody in this business. I'm just a warm hearted person. Um, but Roland pulled me aside and he's like, you know, hey, they were gonna like whoop his ass. You know, like the guys like we're gonna, you know, go off on them uh, for giving the, uh, our new promotion just, you know, some bad reviews on there. And so Roland and the rest of in front of the school, he's like, hey, we want you to talk to him. So you're going to be the one that's going to talk to him because you're the closest to him. And I really didn't know him all that well. I just knew him. I just seen him sometimes in Bay Area wrestling and he was swearing off and all that. But I knew him enough to talk to him. And when the show came um, that week, uh, he came rolling the first through the doors and I waited for him. I'm like, Mike, I go, you can't go back there. We need to talk. And um, I told him about what happened. And I go, dude, you like, you know, you're bad mouth in school and, and you're not wanted here. Um, sorry to bring that on you, man. Uh, but they told me to talk to you about it. Um, and then Roland came up and stepped into the conversation. Next thing you know, Mike's in the back again. And he's interviewing people and then he's giving good reviews and all that. But about a week or two later, um, he called Roland and said, hey, they're looking for a Latino dude that can work, that could fly um, to open a show for When Worlds Collide. And he's going to wrestle Al Snow. And Mo's the guy. That's what he said. So from, I think I earned Mike's respect right there when I stepped up and told him, you know. And I earned the respect of the boys in the back, you know, because show that I'm standing up for them and standing up for the whole uh, business side of it. Um, but I think I earned his respect enough to where he looked out for me on that one and like gave me back, um, you know, um, like a thank you. And he hooked me up with Ron Scholar and they got me up on that show. Ron Scholar and Roland did. And um, I was supposed to wrestle Al Snow. And then when we got into the tunnel and everything was good, we're getting ready to go on. Um, our uh, Arturo Pena, he's like, hey, um, we want to open the show with the midgets. So um, they didn't they didn't want to take the risk towards the end, them and Mike Tanay. And Mike Tanay came up and told us, hey, your, your match is being scratched out. Maybe we could use it later on in the program. And during that program, you could hear them talking about, we're going to add another match on. And you could keep hearing it. Uh, but due to time and, and then rights, due to the fact that me and Al Snow weren't, uh, signed through WCW or we didn't have a contract with AAA or IWC. He was coming from ECW and then I was coming from APW. Um, they didn't want to take the risk. Um, I really wish that they would have because Paul Heyman was out in the crowd and he ended up grabbing Ray Mysterio Jr. and um, uh, Psychosis and Juventud to be on the ECW shows and I could have been I could have been there right alongside of him, you know, yeah. to uh, um, for uh, extreme championship wrestling, you know, early on. Yeah, man, damn, that, that match got scratched. 
Yeah. Let's go back to uh, APW. And uh, when did you join APW, and why did you decide to leave Bay Area Wrestling? I left Bay Area Wrestling because it was a deal gone bad. And what I mean by that was there was a one of the promoters or friends of um, the guy that owned CMLL at the time. Um, I can't remember the guy's name. He he had like Paco a longer Alonso or no? Yeah, Paco Alonso. He was a friend of his. And he came through, as a matter of fact, it might have been Ron School or, or one of them. And they were at the show, and Woody had him on the interview panel when Woody and Mae Young were doing the uh, broadcast, doing the play-by-play -play for the matches. Well, he had him sit in on it. And towards the end there, um, he wanted to use me and Mikey, me and Johnny Pearson, well, Crash Holly. And um, he wanted to talk to Woody about bringing us up to um, – CMLL and he mentioned Negro Casas and and then he gave me like this uh, like Pro Wrestling Illustrated and showed Negro Casas was in like the top 50 at the time um, and all the stuff that he could do for us and they wouldn't even let us really even talk to him you know it, it was and Pepper Gomez is like hey you need to step in there and intervene because I don't know if they're really going to have your best interest at heart um, because none of, nobody else was was brought in on the conversation. Um, my uncle or anybody else or Shane or, or any of those other guys, this is Lucha Libre. You know, they're gonna look for speedy, fast guys that, you know, it's, it's all about character, you know, and, and over the top characters. You're superheroes there, right? So we fit in perfect. And, but the unfortunate part was after their negotiations didn't really work and it worked against me again, here I am getting, uh, left behind again due to the fact of trusting people, uh, I didn't get to go. And um, so I got really upset and they started, they were started jobbing me out again all the time. Um, I don't know how many times I was jobbing out and very wrestling. Um, and don't, don't, don't get me wrong. I, I absolutely have nothing but love for Woody. And I don't think that a lot of the, the decisions, um, were on his part. Mm -hmm. I think they had a lot to do with Kathy Kearney and, and um, maybe a few others. And I know that they were putting my uncle over pretty good. Like he was winning all the time and he was always main eventing and everything else. But on the opposite side, our matches were getting pops um, versus a lot of other matches with Crash Holly. And because we were doing something that was never really seen, but yet we were keeping that storyline in there. So both of us, we were like, we're out of here. And I took the first step and I went and spoke to Roland. And um, actually Roland and Ricky Thomas approached me when we were doing a Newark Pavilion show uh, for uh, Bear Wrestling. They had, I think, Moolah on there or one of those on there. And they said, we're opening a school and we want to do this. And Roland was like, straight up. So come down and, and check out our school. I went down, there was no ring in there. They had no ring at all. They didn't even have a ring yet. It was just Roland's office and a big old empty space. So I went down there and I spoke to him and Roland was like, hey, if you join up with us, um, we got Michael Modest is coming. We got a guy named Sumito um, and a few other students that are getting ready to start when the ring gets here in our first camp. We'll make you the first champion. And he stuck to his word because um, I ended up joining up and I met Mike before because he filled in for me at some Bay Area wrestling uh, shows that I got hurt on and I, I, was, I couldn't work the shows. So he filled in for me, um, but we started there and most of the instructions were from Mike. Um, I'll tell you that, cause if, you know, the guy could out wrestle, you know, he could out wrestle the wrestling Bible, right? Like the guy can just wrestle. Uh, it's, it's just in his DNA. Um, but uh, on the other hand, I could wrestle too. And I, I had that high flying and that martial arts background um, to it. So we ended up mixing it all up. And that style, that, that hard uh, Japan, um, Lucha Libre American style, I, to me, I feel was born right there in that first camp. 
Right on, right on. So who else was in the very first APW boot camp with you? It, it was uh, Mike. It was me. It was uh, a guy named Mike Diamond, who everybody knew as Max Justice, uh, Robert Thompson, a um, guy named Samito, and then um, Matt Heisen came a little bit later. And he had this dog that would, every time you hit the ropes, his German Shepherd would try to attack you. <laughs> right? Um, and uh, then later on, I think in like wave two, it was like Boom Boom Kamini, Steve Rosano, um, a um, few other guys, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it was going to those, going to those camps. What I tell people now is you could go train at somebody's school and have, you know, like go over wrestling stuff. Whereas go to their school and it's, it's a freaking camp. You're going to leave there and you're, you're going to know you were in a fight. Um, it, everything was based around the way that they train in Japan about the dojos. So that was as close to a dojo as you were going to find uh, throughout the United States was at the APW school. And so when um, the show, when the show first started coming, that's um, when we got to display everything we worked hard for and people were just like in awe because they're watching a whole completely different breed of wrestling get born. Um, and if you watch those early APW uh, matches, you'll see that. Um, there, wasn't, there wasn't a lot of, uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, bullshit in those ones. It, it, was, it was wrestling. So were you a big part of Gym Wars when they had the APW Gym Wars? I did some Gym Wars. That came later on. Um, by that time, I've done, I was done doing a lot of shows with uh, Kirk White. Uh, I was doing some shows with him, and um, I was doing a lot of shows still with Woody when he was booking shows. Uh, so he kept me in mind. Now he's putting me over, which was really cool. Um, loved him for that. Uh, and Kirk White was partnered up with um, my old trainer, Smirnoff. And so they brought me on the very first um, big time wrestling show. And it was me and um, Donovan Morgan was under a mask. They called him El, De El Demonio. And so we were kind of like the demons versus La Migra, the Border Patrol, Mike Modest and, and Max Justice. And um, the, match, the match was good. And there was a few mishaps in the match. Um, because we were supposed to be main eventing, and we, I think we were just burnt out and tired from, you know, working week after week, and we were, we were working, uh, I don't know where we were going, some of the towns we were going, I, I, I don't even recollect some of the ones from Gilroy to Mendota to, I never even heard of some of these towns, like, you know, Merced and, and all this, and Yuba City and Ukiah, and, and uh, it, it was all over Northern California, right? Oh. And, Goal, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you didn't know if you were going to be wrestling in a field or you didn't know if you were going to be wrestling in a convention center or an armory or a high school or a junior high or an elementary school parking lot. You didn't know. You just knew that there was a show and to show up and be as professional as you can. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, part of, that's part of the excitement, man, the not knowing where this venue is, what kind of venue it is. You know, just just me rolling around with all you guys recording you guys same little cities. It's like, okay, now we're in a barn. Oh, now we're in a, you know. <laughs> yeah, but you you could vouch. Um, tell me if I'm wrong. You know, I kept it real with everybody that I have been in touch with, including you. Yeah. And I have been, you know, as warm hearted as I possibly can uh, to everybody that was that I was around. And I was honest uh, around everybody that I was around. Um, I wasn't the most outspoken person out of the group, but you knew that I was there somewhere. And I was going to have something to say about something to help somebody out. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've always lived by that thing. You know, you, you treat people to get that right treatment back. Um, but with some of those uh, promoters that were out there, you know, you, you put your heart on the line. And like I said, I was willing to die in that ring. Um, I didn't have a family in those days. Uh, I didn't have a wife and kids. 
I was willing to lay my life out on the line for this business. And when you get somebody like that, it's a different breed of animal because they're going to do whatever it takes to get to the top. But when you get promoters that are, well, if you're wrestling for me, you can't work for this guy. If you're wrestling for that guy, you can't work for this guy. And then the moment you try to venture out, they get so pissed off. Uh, it just runs the whole relationship because of ego. Yeah. Um, that was the only negative side of professional wrestling that I've ever experienced. Because the people that I was around, as far as the, the cast, the crew, um, whoever, it didn't matter if it was, whoever was building the ring, whoever was backstage, whatever. I loved everybody because everybody was part of that show. And that was the way that it worked. We were all connected. So when Super Diablo walked out, he was the camera crew, he was the ring crew, he was, he was that, that kid in the front row, he was everybody in there. Uh, because without all that, there's no match. There's no Super Diablo. Um, and you could do that for any promoter. Yeah. But you can't get that crew that, as to what we had in those days that was so loyal. And I don't know about the crew. I don't know how, about how much you guys were getting paid or, or how those promoters treated you. Um, but if it was anything... Um, towards a little pay and all that stuff that we were getting as wrestlers um, to lay our life out on the line, um, then man, much love to all you guys because it, it, uh, it takes, uh, how do they say it takes a, a, it takes a, village. a village? Yeah. yeah. And it would take a whole crew to make somebody. Yeah, no, I mean, it was fun for us, you know, documenting. Well, it was fun at first, you know, we were young, you know, we get older, then we realize, like, oh, we're documenting history. Like, this is all going to be part of Bay Area wrestling history in general, you know? So that's that was my mentality, and that's why I'm doing, like, kind of this stuff now. It's like, man, we got to talk about the legacy that all these guys uh, uh, are are leaving, you know? Yeah. So the, so, new, the new batch of wrestlers can watch this and be like, oh, you know, this is Super Diablo. No Super Diablo is Jason Styles, no, Chicago Flame, no all these guys, you know. How did, uh, how did the transition to big time wrestling, how was that transition and why did you decide to go to big time? Well, it, 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 I, was, I, was, and I was a rolling guy. You know, I, you know, regardless if you came to blows or whatever it was, you knew right from wrong. And um, you knew the training there. You knew something big was going to come out of there. I didn't know what, but I knew something big. These guys weren't playing around. Like, this was a real deal. Uh, and like I said, me and, me and Smirnoff have been real close. He was like that father figure to me. And he brought me on. And Smirnoff signed me on that show in the main event without me even knowing he showed up and dropped off a poster at my house. And I was like, whoa, like, dude, we never even spoke. You don't even know if I'm even booked on there. He goes, I don't care. He goes, I know that you're gonna show up and you're gonna be real professional about it. He goes, dress, he goes, this is a new promoter, dress up real nice, um, you have a button up or, or a tie, whatever you need to do. Uh, you wanna look professional, walk in there. He goes, so, um, I didn't want to step on Roland's toes. He goes, so I booked a guy that they have there under a mask. We call him El Demonio, and it was, it was, um, uh, God, I mentioned his name earlier. Um, oh, um, Donovan. Donovan Morgan, yeah. Donovan Morgan. Pardon me. Sorry, Donovan, if you're watching this, man. Um, I've been hit too many times, bro. Uh, and um, Mike Modest and Max Justice is La Migra. And um, so we were on the first one. And then after that, I don't know what happened for other shows, but they weren't booked on there. But I was booked on there. And I think it had a lot to do with uh, Smirnoff. So they were booking me in all these uh, matches. Uh, I think the second time I was there, I worked against Jason Styles, and he was wrestling under Jason Rogers at the time. Um, and so I don't know if Jason was so much used to catching people in those days because of the more older style of the uh, Bay Area wrestling schools. 
uh, that burst the uh, APW schools, but um, um, he found out really fast, you know, that he, he had to catch me and that was part of our stuff. Um, and me and Jay, me and Jason, um, not only did we hit it off when I was there in Bay Area Wrestling, but the new and improved version of me and the new and improved version of him really, really hit it off. And we became really good friends. And we were wrestling each other so much over the next few years um, for big time wrestling. We just had that chemistry and it worked. And so they kept bringing me back. So then I show back up at the APW school and everybody's like kind of giving me the cold, cold shoulder, you know? And I thought, I'm like, man, this is like, you guys are my, my boys, right? Um, what's going on here? Um, and Roland's like, uh, he puts me on a gym war show and against Frank Dalton. And Frank is like hitting me like really hard. You know, um, I, I, I don't know the difference between a shoot and I don't know the difference between getting hit hard because a lot of my matches have a lot of that in them regardless. Um, but I, if some felt out of the ordinary with that match and, and I really liked Frank, um, I would later on go on to work for him and Modest uh, and Donovan over at Pro Wrestling Iron, but um, they were nice enough to think of me for there. But I know at that time, I don't know if Roland told them to go out there and probably give him, put some of the boots to me in that Jim Wars match, but they found out real quick that I wasn't, you know, I wasn't no punk, you know, that you can do that to, you know? Um, and so I, I, I stiffened up a little bit more and the match actually looks really good on film. Um, so that's the main part. Yeah. And we hugged each other at the end, at the, uh, when we went in the back and, and everything was all good. But then when I looked in the mirror, I had a black eye and I had a fat lip um, without my mask. And I was a little bummed there. Um, and then I went to a few practices after that and they really weren't um, treating me like they were before. Uh, and then Robert Thompson came up to me at, at a, a Christmas party and he's like, Hey brother, he goes, you're doing the right thing. Go with the money. And I'm like, what the hell does that mean? You know, he goes, go with the money. And next thing you know, I'm not booked on anything. And, um, uh, I just stayed, uh, booking over there at a uh, big time wrestling. Yeah. And, um, Jason gave me a place to train. He said, Hey Mo, come train with us. He never charged me um, anything like that. Uh, he welcomed me in like I was his brother. Um, and man, he, he ended up becoming one of my best friends in the whole business. Yeah, uh, yeah. Him and Shane Cody and, and uh, the crew that was there. Um, I loved them all, man. Um, I thought maybe I found a new home. Um, even though my I felt like my home was in APW and that APW always ran through my blood and and I could totally see it Roland's way because on the very first program for the shows, he had Matt, well, Spike Dudley, flying through the ropes. And then on the second program, I was on the cover of the program, but then yet I wasn't on the shows. Um, so I guess he wanted to market me in there. And by that time, we've done, did the One Worlds Collide and done wrestled with um, CMLL and everything else and all the other stuff that we've done. Um, so I went with um, big time wrestling for a while. And then I ended up, they called me back and Roland goes, we're going to do um, a big tournament and we're going to crown champions. They're going to crown the heavyweight champion and the light heavyweight champion. And they go, we want you to be in the light heavyweight tournament. Would it be all right with you? Uh, I go, yeah, no problem. And I was wrestling for bear wrestling and big time at that time. Um, they weren't really doing the sh all the shows like they're doing now, um, but it was every now and then. So um, I did the tournament and Roland goes, I told you I'm going to keep my word. And he made me the very first uh, light heavyweight champion um, for APW. Uh, I don't know if that title even still exists there, mm -hmm. but, uh, there. but I know that uh, the tournament was in Modesto. And um, I had a tournament final match. Um, I don't remember if it was over Donovan or over Crash. Um, I don't remember too much. Um, 
but he kept to his word and, and all the guys hugged me in the back and, and Mike Modest hugged me and, and said, welcome back, brother, and, and we missed you. And, and man, it, it felt good to be embraced by your, by your people again, you know? But on the other hand, I was forming a whole nother family uh, in the big time wrestling group because um, Jason and Shane and, and all them, and even Woody Farmer was there at a lot of this stuff. And I really, I loved Woody. He, he was a fantastic human being. Uh, and then Smirnoff was there. So I felt like I was going back to a really good family. Uh, yeah. But I wanted to get that exposure to possibly spread out. But the difference with big time wrestling and APW is APW wasn't bringing in no big stars to be on those shows. Big time wrestling was. So at one time, they even had me booked against Rey Mysterio. So um, I wrestled Marty Jannetty there. I wrestled Tom Brandy there. I've uh, been in the ring with Greg, Greg Valentine, with um, Sergeant Slaughter, with Coco B. Uh, well, no, I did a Coco B. Wear one for the Stars of Wrestling show. Um, but I was in there with a lot of stars that he brought out, Bruce Beefcake. And, and these are when these guys are fresh off TV. So you also you know, wrestled guys, a, lot of, a lot of upcoming indie guys like Reckless Youth. Yeah, Reckless Youth, yeah. That was an Al Snow guy. Mm -hmm. So Al Snow and D'Lo Brown wrestled them. Well, they trained them. And the matches I had with Reckless Youth, um, I learned a lot from those matches. And um, we just went all out. Um, that guy really pushed the, pushed the envelope um, to where he knew that he wanted to get over that hill because he had to impress Al Snow and D'Lo to get him in the WWE. And I knew that if I could keep up with this guy, that my time was coming because people were watching him. Um, but on the other hand, in the Bay Area, when I came out uh, in that match, um, not really many people knew who he was, but they knew who I was. Yeah. So I was over and I'm like, wow, that's even going to be even better for me to get eyes on me um, to, get, to get more bookings and possibly a WWE tryout or a WCW tryout. Now that's a perfect segue right now. You did have a tryout. Was it for WCW? I tried out for WWE, uh -huh. and they were the WWF at the time. And nobody did anything for me. Uh, all I did was I sent the tape in. I sent them, I think I sent them like six hours of footage oh, wow. uh, on VHS. Yeah. And um, Bruce Pritchard called me probably about three or four days later. And I thought it was, I thought it was a rib, you know, I thought it was a hoax. And I'm like, uh, they're like, Hey, this is Bruce Pritchard from WWE and we want to book you in San Jose. Uh, and I'm like, Jason, sh shut up, man. And I freaking hung the phone up on him, <laughs> you know, cause Jason was known to do shit like that. Right. <laughs> and then, no, or Kirk, Jason Piles. oh dude, or Kirk White would call you and he would be in Alexis Smirnoff's voice. Right. And he's like, Hey, you know, this is Smirnoff, you know, and, we want to book you, Mo, you know, on this show. And, and so you didn't know who you were talking to. So I hung the phone up on him. And then he called me right back and he goes, before you hang up, my name is Bruce Pritchard. You see me on TV as Brother Love. He goes, I'm one of the talent uh, agents uh, for talent relations from WWF. And we would like to book you in a dark match um, uh, for San Jose and for Fresno. And if it works out, then we're going to, uh, if we have enough time, we want to book you. Uh, I don't remember down south somewhere. It might have been San Diego or one of the, those other ones. And um, my, my jaw just fell to the floor. And the only phone that we had in the house, because my gra I was still staying with my grandmother. It's just me and her. One was way in the front of this big house, in the front, in the front there, or the one that she had in her room next to her bed. And that was the one that I, that when she answered, she called me and I came over and I got on there. And I'm on that thing, my mouth dropped and my grandmother's like, hey, who's on the phone? And when we finished the phone call, um, she just started crying. And she's like, mijo, she goes, she goes, I'm so happy for you. She goes, this made everything that me and your grandfather did for you come around and she gave me the biggest hug and she just kept telling me how proud of me she was and and she you know she was just so happy and 
it was so weird because after that call and people heard I was going to uh, possibly get a chance to be in the WWF, I had everybody from cousins to friends to people I've never even heard of in years. Everybody's all of a sudden coming around to come and see me and, and hey, you know, I was always there for you. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> you know, just one of those things. And I, I, get to, I get to the school over there at Jason's that Wednesday and Kurt's up there and Kurt tells everybody, hey, you know, Mo got a tryout. So um, uh, Jason was like, really happy for me and, and everybody in the school was really happy for me. And um, I ended up taking the Jason with me to my tryout. Um, they called me the day of San Jose and then they're like, hey, there's no, no room, um, we're, we're running late on broadcast. So you're for sure on tomorrow in Fresno. And um, we shot it to Fresno and I tried, I tried to talk to them. They're like, hey, we got you booked already in this opening match. And I'm like, well, I brought my guy already. Um, maybe we can have that match go on with me and Jason because I'm used to him. Um, and Rene Goulet is like, no. He goes, no, nah, kid, we already have a guy that we're looking at. His name's uh, Frankie Kazarian. He's a good kid. They introduced me to him. And we didn't even have enough time to even go over that match. So by the time that we got made it down to the ring, um, after we all had lunch together and all that, um, all the big stars were in the ring already, from the Dudleys to – the Rock to all of them, they were all in the ring and the show's almost ready to start and nobody's giving up no space um, for us to work on anything. Uh, so we just had to outlive it. And then I know when I first got in that ring, that ring was a whole lot larger. It was a whole lot bigger than the rings that I was used to. I was used to, you know, the smaller speed rings and that ring, it felt like it took me forever just to run across the ropes. It was a bigger ring because of the size of athletes that they had in WWE. Uh, so I had me and me and Frankie, well, Kazarian, we had to adjust to that really, really fast. And then when we did the first spot, he goes and he's supposed to like hit the middle ropes and he's supposed to do like this reverse dive on me and come off the rope, you know, to keep the excitement rolling in that first spot. Totally just slipped right off the ropes and fell right on his head. And um, the spot was just blown. And I got on him, and he's like, oh, I'm so sorry, man. I'm so sorry I blew your, I blew your trial. I'm like, don't worry about it, man. We're still out here. You know, we're, we're still doing it. And so I think that the biggest mistake we made was we redid that spot again, and then the crowd was already booing us as it is because we weren't WWE guys. And then I started hitting these head scissors and these big arm drags, and then they started cheering and cheering and cheering. And then uh, the referee's like, oh, yeah, it's picking up. It's going good. They gave you guys an extra two minutes. So I'm like, oh, this is fantastic. So the average tryout is like, I think like eight minutes. And then they ended up giving us like 12, I think it was like 12 or 13 minutes. And so I'm like, this is cool. So we ended up working it up and went into that, uh, that tiger bomb. And then um, I hopped up and did the uh, split leg and moonsault on him for the finish. And um, the crowd jumped up and they, they loved it. So, um, the, uh, the beginning of the match started out a little rocky, but the end of the match is what actually mattered. Um, but I was surprised when I, when I came out, you know, they, um, when I came out, I, I really couldn't hear much. I didn't know what was going on. I know that, I know Stephanie grabbed me by the hand and then she like, hey, you need to go up here, you need to stand here. And then they're gonna tell you when to walk out. I never heard nobody telling me anything. <laughs> All I remember <laughs> is hearing Bruce Pritchard and, and I think it might have been Vince. They were like, get the fuck out there already. You know, like that's part of my language. Like, you know? So I go walking out and dude, people started cheering me. And it, it felt great, you know, to be in a big old um, uh, arena full of people. Um, and then to hear you, hear them cheering for you even louder after was even yeah. better. And with them cheering me like that, I thought for sure that they were going to sign me then and there. Um, so then they called me, Bruce Pritchard called me about a few days after that. And he's like, Hey kid, can you lose weight? He's like, um, can you lose, you know, about 25, 30 pounds. And the next time we're coming back around, uh, we want to bring you on, on our shows to open them. Um, and possibly this could lead to something bigger. And I knew May Young at that time and the small contract that I had assigned at that time, the waiver and shit. 
it, it was thick. It wasn't like just signing like one piece of paper. It, it was it was like applying for a house, right? So um, it was like a lot of signatures going on there and half that stuff, I didn't even know what I was even signing, to be honest. And May Young's like, like helping me out with the whole thing. Um, and she, I remember she just kept asking me about my Uncle Danny, right? She loved my Uncle Danny. I mean, I don't know if she wanted to uh, <laughs> go out on a date with him or, or what, yeah. but she loved him, man. And um, she kept asking me about that, and she helped me out quite a bit over there. And then um, Renee Galay helped uh, get me my pay and everything else. And um, he's like, hey, you know, tell Smirnoff, uh, you know, I said hello, and, you know, I'll be calling them and all that. Him and Smirnoff were really good friends. Um, but I do know that after that match was over, I felt really good. And Jason asked me, he goes, what was it like? He goes, the match turned out really good. He goes, it started rocky, but then it turned out really good. And I go, it was incredible, man. I go, I'm on cloud nine. I've never experienced anything like that, bro. And we're walking on. They gave us security. And here's what I, here's where I always go back to giving back. I'm sorry if I'm taking up a lot of time. Um, but when we were leaving, the security wants to walk you from the arena straight to your car. They don't want nobody near you. They don't want no interaction, no nothing. I made sure that that didn't happen because there was people lined up all outside of that arena waiting just to get any picture, any um, autograph, anything that they possibly can. Um, so I stopped security and security's like, what are you doing? And Jason's like, what are you doing Mo? And I go, I've waited my whole life for this. I go, I was that kid right there, you know? And so I went over there, I reached in my bag, I pulled out a stack of pictures that I had. I never ever leave home without them. I always have them. And I just started signing pictures for everybody that was out there, you know, and started taking pictures with people, um, all that. And I turn around and security's like this, you know, even though they knew that I wasn't supposed to do that, yeah. I did it anyway, regardless. And I think that was the best part of my trial was that, was that moment with the fans um, was what made it all worth it. Now, in all this, like your style, you know, it, it's very high risk, uh, a lot of high risk maneuvers and, and you have gotten hurt. And I believe in 2000, you even retired, right? Because I remember there was like a retirement speech and you were doing more of a commissioner role for big time wrestling. Can yeah. you talk to us about that? Well, what happened was uh, in that time that, that WWE, um, well, WWF at the time, uh, wanted me to lose the weight to go to give me another tryout. Um, I know that WCW was uh, looking to give me a trial as well when they came to, to the Cow Palace. Uh, but in the meantime, I had to take on other shows to, um, you know, fill the void. You know, you have to always stay busy in this business or else people forget about you in the drop of the dime. You know, the next big thing will come. So you got to work hard at it. And so I'm doing the show with, with Kirk and uh, I think at James Logan High School. And for some of the people that are world worldwide that are watching this, um, have no idea as to how big James Logan High School is. It's the size of a college. It's, it's huge. And we were out on the field and it looks like on one side because they have nobody on one side, but then when you flip to the other side, they had roller derby and, at the same time. And then they had just the stands were just packed, right? Uh, so I opened the show there and it was to the agreement that I thought that I was for sure going to go back to WWF and I was already done losing my weight and everything. Well, I went up for that same finish that I, that I did in WWF, a split leg and moonsault and I had different trunks on for that outside show. So I had more of a stickier type of latex trunk on versus the spandex one and then the ropes weren't as tight as they should have been and so when i hit that moonsault those trunks stuck me so it was like it was like tape sticking on there and it let me go but then i went up and it fell right onto my head We were supposed to come out for the battle royal after. Um, as a matter of fact, I was so mad that 
in that match that that happened on my part, I grabbed a belt that was my championship belt and I just gave it to my opponent. Mm -hmm. uh, I just gave it to him and I, I, I got off the ring. I went to the back and everybody's coming up to me and they're like, are you okay? And, and man, I'm, I'm just not feeling good at all. I had the worst pain throughout my head and my neck area. It was so severe. Um, so I told Roland, um, Kirk White goes, hey, Mo, you're going to be okay to come out in the Battle Royal. They were doing the big Battle Royal at the end. And I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like, no, you're not going to come out. And I go, why? I go, no, screw that, dude. This is what I'm here for. You know, I want to get my name out there. And, you know, you know me, Kirk. I go, we, we've done everything together, man. I go, let, let me just go out there. So as a favor for me, it felt like that in my heart. He canceled that Battle Royal for me just not to be in there and get any more hurt. And I ended up going out to dinner and Roland and his crew were in the same place yeah. where we went to dinner. And I had a seizure at the table when I was waiting for my food. And I had the uh, worst amount of sweat that started pouring down. I never even got my food. I was severely thirsty. They rushed me to the emergency and I had fractured C6 and 7 in my neck. So I had a broken neck and um, it was over after that. So it took, it took WWF probably about 10 days after that to call me up and just say, Hey, um, they didn't, um, Bruce Pritchard didn't call me. It was Kevin Kelly. He called me up and said, Hey, um, we're not going to use you no more. And um, we're just going to put you in the archives and good luck to you kid. And that's it. Damn. Um, yeah, and uh, for a while there, I know that the people in APW thought that I died. I know that um, Roland was there when that seizure happened, and he caught me on the way out, and um, he's like, you don't look so good and all that. And, and I don't know what happened at that camp, but there was a rumor going around that I died, and, and uh, which was all bullshit. Um, but I was well alive, and then Kirk just kept me, kept me on the shows, you know? He kept me as commissioner to do that for a while. And um, that was a true friend, and I was very happy with that. Um, I can't say anything negative about that. Uh, he kept me busy, so it was cool. And then when I was ready to go, um, he brought me back in a tag team match with uh, Golden Lion, mm -hmm. and we went against the Ballards, and the match was incredible. Uh, and it came out to a huge reaction, uh, welcome back and everything else from the fans, and, and it was nice. Yeah. Yeah, that, I, I do remember that that time. And then, you know, going forward, uh, 2003, I started promoting some shows and you worked some shows against Joe Applebomber on my shows. And then later on, when Pro Wrestling Iron started, um, I had brought in this luchador, a luchador named Roquero del Diablo, and they were looking for a partner for him. So I'm like, oh, dude, Super Diablo. So that's when uh, you were contacted by Pro Wrestling Iron. Can you tell us a little bit about your time at Pro Wrestling Iron, and then also reconnecting with Crash Holly, who came in towards the end, right before he passed. Um, I like Pro Wrestling Iron, and that was um, one of those things that got me, um, I would say that they tried to blackball me um, from big time wrestling. Um, I don't know for sure if the whole thing about it, I'm sure I'll probably get a phone call after this or whatever, but this is the way that I feel about it. I feel like they, you know, tried to blackball me and we tried to come to terms to get me to go back at least two or three times and it just didn't work out. Um, they weren't even going to budge, weren't going to give me the time of day. I felt like I've never done anything wrong to them. I was always just, uh, I'd show up to the shows, book, do my, do my do, duty and leave, you know, and have a fun time and make money together. I thought that's what the whole thing was about. Uh, you know, putting asses in the seats and making money together. Uh, but they were taking other sources of interest over um, booking younger talent and um, not going what makes money. Um, but reality wise, when Mike called me, Mike Modest called me to do the Pro Wrestling Iron. Apparently he contacted Kirk White before uh, and wanted to use more of their talent too. Uh, to kind of do a co cool thing because they were pro wrestling iron when Mike and them left, they left on really bad terms with Roland. Well, so, 
it was it was bad. It was war. Um, I don't know what happened. Um, I hear a lot of things with a lot of uh, in other indie guys that were involved in that thing. Um, I don't know. I can't really mention names because I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. But I know that it was a big old jab in the heart. And, you know, me, me and Mike being close friends that we are, uh, he told me somewhat about it. And I'm not really going to get into that part because that's, I'll leave that for his interview. But um, I will say that him and Donovan called me and Frank Dalton and they say, we're doing this. We want to use some big time wrestling guys. But Kirk White is saying that you guys aren't available and you guys are always booked and he's not going to uh, let you guys leave. And so I was like, I didn't know that I was under contract with him. You know, it's not like as if I'm in the WWF and we're, we're not allowed to work for WCW or we're not allowed to work for AAA or, or whatever, you know? Um, and I'm like, that sounds real weird. And he's like, yeah. Um, he goes, you might want to talk to Kirk. He goes, but we want to use you on this show and we're willing to pay you this. And so I called Kirk after that. I go, hold on, Mike, don't book me yet. I go, just let me talk to Kirk first, you know, and I called him up on the phone. I asked him about it. And he started just yelling at me, um, you know, cussing me out. And he's like, hey, you know, when you come to the school, come to the school and I'll, I want to talk to you there. And if I want to job you out, I'm going to job you out and, and all this. And they only want to give you $25 and, which was all, you know, bullshit, you know, I never, ever made $25 in Pro Wrestling Iron. It was, it was always a bill up, whether they had, whether they had um, um, a crowd or not, they always paid me. Um, I never, ever went without pay there, and it was always paid good, and uh, there was even times where they would even give me my gas and all the other stuff, which was cool. Um, so here I am, and with processing iron and all that, but Kirk wouldn't even give me the time of day after that. And, you know, I could kind of see things his way because of the fact that I was headlining his shows and it's kind of a slap to the face. Um, but on the other hand, he had to see things my way too, is I felt like I was stuck in a, in a place that I wasn't going to get to go out and venture any, anymore. Yeah. And this was my chance to, uh, possibly land a contract with uh, Noah Japan with through Mitsuhara Misawa and Ogawa, um, who I would be able to do shows with those guys through Pro Wrestling Iron um, later on as they got going. But on the other hand, when you look at the team that Pro Wrestling Iron had, they had, you know, not, I'm not separating the, the two because everybody's done work for big time and everybody's done work for Iron and all that. But you had everybody from Christopher Daniels to Vic Grimes to Bison Smith to um, just a lot of big hitters, uh, Mitsuhara Misawa, you know, just all those guys, uh, worldwide people um, on these shows um, that were used to traveling. And you know, you know how it is in that business. You know, you're you're only as good as your last match, and people forget about you really fast. And I wanted to make sure that. I could get my name out there and I, I, I go, you know, it's time for me to get to that next level. And I thought that that would be it. And it didn't work like, it didn't work out for me like that because um, um, I know I got a lot of news coverage and I ended up like on the cover of the newspaper and all the other stuff for, for pro wrestling iron when I crossed over. Um, but I don't know if it was the best idea, but it felt, I, I would, I would do it all over again if I could. Um, I wouldn't change a thing because I got to be around a lot more of my friends, my extended family, because my family was, you know, Jason Stiles and, and Shane and all those. And I still love those guys to death, man. Um, uh, hopefully they didn't take my departure that hard, which, you know, it feels like it was a big, um, like as if I lost a lot of friendship um, when I left. But I don't consider myself leaving. I consider myself forced out. And that's something that they need to take up with their promoter um, on that because my friendship with them never changed. And, you know, I'd love to talk to these guys and go out to eat with these guys or whatever, you know, if they're out there watching. But um, I know that me and Mike go back way back and Mike Modest and Frank Dalton and those guys, we almost died together. I mean, it's, you know, we started a whole legacy. 
of course I'm going to have love for these guys, you know. Um, but on the other hand, you have my longtime friend like um, Mikey Lockwood, Crash Holly, that I got to spend my spend his final days with him. Um, we were on a show together in Santa Cruz, and I, I think that was the last time I seen him um, alive. He died. He died about a week later, and when I heard the news, I just broke down, and I'm still tearing up right now. Yeah. Um, all I remember is is sitting out there in the stands, just me and him talking about, you know, how it all did full circle. And even when I was in WWE, he came over, well, WWF, he came over with Kurt Angle. And here I am sitting at the table. They were the only ones out of every superstar there that would even sit at the table and have lunch with me. And they did with me and Jason. And Jason can vouch for that. And Tony Jones was there. Um, those guys were so down to earth. And um, if I could thank Kurt, um, Kurt Angle to this day for showing me you know, respect and, and kindness, I would. Um, and with Mikey Lockwood, um, I thought maybe he would forget about a lot of us because he was such a big star as Crash Holly, and he never did. Um, he kept it real and he came and sat with the, with the people, man. And, and on that final moment when we were in Santa Cruz and we were talking, I was watching my daughter playing with his daughter and they were the same age and they were playing around the ring um, and all that, and Manny Fernandez was out there chasing them around, you know, like the old grandfather, you know, it's like, ah, you know, um, but, um, man, dude, um, after he, he died, it, it was hard, you know, um, I didn't, I didn't want to wrestle no more, it was, it was just one of those things, you know, I, I, I could see, I, I'm looking at the little girl running around the ring, and I'm saying, her dad's gone, you know, do I want my daughter to wake up one day and then I'm not there? Um, so that whole wrestler mentality of, you know, I'm willing just to die in the ring, um, it, it, it left that day. Um, it left after he was um, gone. Yeah. But in that business, you got to watch it because you get close to somebody and the next minute they're taken away from you like that. Wrestling is just that kind of business um, from Eddie Guerrero to, to uh, what Benoit did. And um, just, it, it just keeps going and going. Bison Smith, you know, the thing is, is I knew all those guys. Um, I just didn't like hear about them. You know, I just didn't hear about Eddie or hear about Benoit or hear about Bison Smith. I knew them all. And I was re really close to Crash Hawley. And so was Jason. Jason was real close to, to uh, Mikey Lockwood, he was real close to uh, him. And um, as a matter of fact, the leprechaun gimmick that he thought of, that he came out in, in APW, um, we were sitting in my living room at my grandmother's house, and I'm the one that thought of that gimmick. And this, you know, you know, he comes out in APW and he's the leprechaun. Mm -hmm. And then he tried out in WWE with it, and then it, they kept him. And um, they gave him his contract, and he became Crash Holly. So that goes to show you how close we were, you know. Yeah. yeah. And just to, just to wind down, our last question is, do uh, you have any regrets uh, from the business, and what are your future plans? I would love to be able to get one last run just to say goodbye um, to everybody. The only regret that I've ever had in this business was the fact that I always wanted to wrestle um, a guy named Jushin Liger. And as you can tell, a lot of my mask is patterned after his. And I don't care about a trademark deal or I don't care about anything. And I know that a few promoters tried to get that together. And he's just so hard because there's a lot more that comes to booking him than just calling him on the phone and booking him. Because um, he's such a huge star. But it didn't matter if I had to go to a dojo or whatever it's at, if he wants to do it in the backyard or whatever. I just wanted to be in the ring with with that guy and that would solidify the fact that I've been in there with the best yeah. and um, that would be about my only regret and would I change things um, the only thing I would change is I would try to have patched things up a whole lot more with with Roland and, and with uh, Kirk White um, be because of the fact that um, 
I felt like we got separated on something that I felt that I don't, I still don't understand what happened. Um, I think it was just an act of, of, they felt like I was maybe backstabbing them uh, for wanting to venture out and do more. Um, if that's what they think, you know, much apologies for that. I know that Roland wanted to bring me back to APW and um, I even showed up at his school when he told me to and I didn't have much time to sit around and wait for him. So we scheduled another date to do it because he wanted to bring me back to uh, get another run with APW and then he would end up dying. Um, and I would, I would love to sit down and just, even if I'm not booked or whatever, just to see what's up with Kirk White and see, you know, just to venture out because I know that my daughter wants to get into pro wrestling now and it's always good to have friends in this business. Um, but I don't want her to get shot down, you know, and just ruin it for her, you know? Um, but, um, I, as far as that's about it. And as far as thanking anybody, I just want to get out and thank all my friends, man. Um, thank you, Jesus, for, for thinking of me for this, um, interview. Thank you, Jason, for being, Jason Sal, for being a good friend to me and giving me a place to train, uh, being, being a good pal. Thank you, Shane, for being that older brother that I've never had, you know, Shane Cody and, and his dad, you know, they know a lot about my life. Thank you to Mike Modest and Max Marquez. You know, Max, <laughs> Max is my boy, man. I love Max, uh, referee and, and thank you. Thank you to all those guys, uh, for being there, being my friends throughout this whole thing and thinking of me. And, um, I want to put out uh, Stars of Wrestling, too, with Icebox and, and um, uh, Tony Fury. Um, my wife still talks to Tony Fury's wife, and Icebox still keeps in touch with my family. And, and when things got at the absolute worst for me, um, I will give a big uh, shout out to Icebox for thinking of me uh, because he thought of me. Never once did he ever hold, hold back on pay. Uh, one night I left the show early because I just wasn't feeling good after my match was done. And I know that, that that's disrespectful to a lot of other matches I wanted to watch, but I left early. And he showed up at my house the next day and still paid me. Uh, so thank you to those guys that looked after me. Um, much appreciated. And for those that I forgot about, you know, um, to mention here, I'm so sorry. Uh, thank you, Ron Head. And, J.R. Benson, um, these guys, and and I gotta thank I gotta thank um, Mike Leno. Mike Leno, um, Mike helped me out. And he tried, and I was honest with him. He was honest with me, um, and um, just all that you know, from announcers to to referees, everybody I've ever been in the ring with. Um, thank you guys. For giving me that time of your life um, to showcase uh, my life and uh, to dictate the way that my life was going to go and help build this character. Um, thank you guys all, everybody, and, and hopefully I can get out there and be able to say goodbye. And, um, you know, I know you did the interview with Wildstorm. I want to thank Wildstorm for the matches that we had. Uh, some of those matches were so completely insane. Um, you, you got the footage. <laughs> I just, actually, right before uh, we went on, I watched your match with Wild Storm at the Pavilion. It was a hardcore match. Yeah. yeah and that's the one where he didn't go through the table and I kept trying to throw him through the table. Yep. Yeah. Um, some of those matches, I wrestled them more than just that time. Yeah. Um, we wrestled a lot of places. Um, and some of those matches were so incredible. Um, I want to thank him for that too. Uh, I know that I've, I've walked down that aisle. I know I've gotten those ropes. Um, I've done what I wanted to do in life. And when people told me that I'll never ever amount to nothing, I may not have ever been that superstar that um, I was hoping to be, but I got a taste of it. I got to meet as many as people as possible, some of the greatest um, performers in wrestling of all time. 
and some of the most unique and most honest and beautiful people um, you'll ever meet in my life um, that make me who I am. And so that has a lot to do with who I am at home, uh, with my kids as a friend. It has to do with as a husband. Um, it made me a better person, the wrestling business did. And I thank every, everything for it. Um, so yeah, it's just, thank you so much, man, for giving me this opportunity to be on your show. No, thank you, man. And like I said, thank you for having my back since, you know, since I was 17 years old and I had that incident with the police there in New York days. So I appreciate you having my back then. And uh, yeah, anything I can do for you. Um, I'm glad we got to do this because I know you have younger kids who did not get to see you wrestle live. So this will be a kind of, uh, they'll, they'll see their dad's legacy, you know, through this interview. So that, that makes me happy that I'm able to do that. Thanks again, Super Diablo. Thank you, everybody, for watching Indie Handshake. I've been Jesus Cruz with Super Diablo. We'll catch you next time. All right, guys.